don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a pandemic going on. Right? I'm not talking about the pandemic in the world. I'm talking about there's a pandemic going on in the nation of our emotions. There's a pandemic going on in the nation of our emotions, our emotional state. And this particular virus, this particular virus is responsible and has taken more lives unexpectedly than our minds can fathom. I'm talking about the virus of stress. Stress, stress. And as I was preparing for this sermonic journey on this afternoon, there was a scripture that I was reading this morning. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. It says, anxiety in the heart. Certain translations say turmoil or stress. Stress in the heart of man causes depression. That's in the Bible, y'all. Anxiety, stress, turmoil in the heart of man causes depression. But a good word, a good word makes it glad. So my prayer this morning was I said, God, would you anoint my tongue as your paintbrush? Not to just give an opinionated word, but to give a good word. Not to give a plagiarized word, but to give a good word. Not to give my viewpoint, my perspective, or political views. We have enough of that. We need sound doctrine. I believe you came here to hear a rhema word from God, to hear the soundtrack of heaven. God, so would you use me as your vessel and your vessels all over the world to give a good word. Amen. Somebody say stress. stress. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, for the next several weeks, we are going to war with stress. And I'm going to challenge your perspective. Each and every week, this word is going to come for your edges and your life. I'm going to challenge your perspective. For starters, many of us think we're stressed out because of what's happening. What if I told you you're not just stressed out over what's happening, but you're stressed because of your perspective over what's happening? Okay, okay. Could it be that stress does not just rob you of tomorrow's joy? But stress vandalizes your opportunity to experience peace on today. Did y'all hear what I just said? Yes, yeah, stress doesn't just rob you of tomorrow's joy, but it also vandalizes the opportunity for you to experience peace on today because that's what stress does. It robs moments. Robs moments. You can't even enjoy the moment because you're stressed. You're blessed, but you don't feel stressed because be, feel blessed because of the stress. Because that's what stress does. Stress robs moments. Somebody say stress. 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 You're stressed out about where you've been, and you're stressed out about where you are. You're stressed out about where you're going, and you're stressed out about where you're not at yet. You're stressed out about how they did you, and then you're stressed out about how they left. But Pastor Jay, you don't understand how they did me. You don't understand my story. You sweating and talking about all that stuff. You don't understand. I just need closure. If I were to get some closure, that would start the journey of my healing. But uh, ma'am <laughs> or sir, the disrespect was the closure. Okay, I'm back, y'all. Yeah. The, the verbal abuse was the closure. The manipulation was the closure. The willingness to get you to engage in sin and disregard what God said we should do, that was the closure. The drawing trying to get you engaged in self-sabotaging, disrespectful living towards God was the closure. Stress, stress, stress. You're stressed by their comments and you're stressed by the lack of support. Why didn't that support me? I thought they would share my stuff. How could they not be proud that I'm no longer addicted to hookah? 
How could they not be proud that I got over that? I know they're not jealous of me. Can I tell y'all something? Sometimes people are jealous because you're not suffering the way they thought you would. Oh boy. They're jealous because you're not suffering the way that they thought you would be suffering because God knows how to restore the years that the canker worm has stolen. Stress, stressed, stressed by your mistakes and stressed by perfectionism. Every eye got to be dotted. Every T got to be crossed. Some of us, the reason you haven't started that channel or you haven't launched that blog is because to you it's not perfect. And because it's not perfect, perfectionists, I'm coming for you. Because it's not perfect, you're barren. God's been telling you to do this since 2017, but it's not perfect. I don't have the right camera. I don't have the right platform. I don't have the studio. Because it's not perfect, and this is just something I've learned, it is better, like mistakes are better than fake perfection with no peace. Did y'all hear me? Like I learn from mistakes. Mistakes are my school, not my prison. I learn from them. I'm just not bound by them. <laughs> Mistakes are better than fake perfection with no peace. There are two types of people under the sound of my voice on this afternoon. One person, you are one thought away from stressing yourself out. You are one more thought away from a mental breakdown. And then there's another person, you are one thought away from inward calmness. It's one thought. One thought. Somebody say stress. Stress. Stressed. Stress. Stress. Stressed by what you see. Stressed by how you think. Can we talk, y'all? Yeah. Many of us don't understand a calm mind is the secretary for discernment. If I was a note taker, I'd write that down. Yeah. A calm mind is the secretary, meaning it works for it. A calm mind is the secretary for discernment. You cannot have high stressful thoughts and have high spiritual discernment at the same time. This is why your devotion life matters because you cannot focus on that which is eternal and be stressed by that which is temporal at the same time. Did y'all hear what I just said? This is why Colossians, he says, set your mind and your affections on things above, not on things beneath. I can't be focused on what's eternal and stressed out by what's temporal at the same time. It's the secretary for Discernment, And sometimes the church has been guilty of over-spiritualizing things by saying, this, I need you to cast out this unhealthy habit. I come against and I cast out all dysfunction. And I'm just sitting there listening to this person prophesy, and I'm like, um, <laughs> somebody caught it. I'm just listening to this person prophesy. We cast out unhealthy thoughts and we cast out dysfunction. I'm like, you can't cast out dysfunction. You have to unlearn it. See, how you cast out somebody who loves McDonald's? You can't cast that out. You can't cast out a poor diet. It takes teaching, revelation, and enlightenment. It takes discipleship because you can say, Jesus, come save me, but you still desire what you used to have. So I need discipleship to help me to unlearn what I used to love. I want to encourage somebody this afternoon and watching online who is stressed out. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. I want to say it one more time for the married couple who feels as though divorce is imminent. 
and you don't know how your marriage could survive this, you feel like it's in this dead and dull place, I need to remind you that our God specializes in resurrecting dead things. I came to encourage you, every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. There is a blessing somewhere in this problem. Stress does not have to be your disposition. I'm going to say it one more time for the single mother who feels stressed out trying to raise these children on her own. She's trying to raise these children, this son and this daughter on her own, and she's not getting any help from the father. And she doesn't have any support system. I'm talking about natural father. He does the bare minimum, and you're trying to keep your sanity. I want to encourage you this afternoon. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. There is a blessing somewhere in this problem. Stress does not have to be your disposition. I'm going to say it again for the person that's about to start college and you're about to take 15 to 18 hours this semester along with the job, along with trying to keep your faith, along with practicing purity. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. There is a blessing somewhere in this problem. Stress does not have to be your disposition. I'm going to say it again for the person that just wants some financial neck room. I'm talking to anybody. Every time your budget starts to kind of get in order, an alternator breaks, a radiator breaks, something has broken in the house, and you're like, God, can a brother or a sister just get some financial neck room? I want to give more. I want to do more. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. There's a blessing somewhere in this problem. Stress does not have to be your disposition. For the individual who feels like, okay, I'm praying, I'm seeking God, I'm serving, but it seems as though my prayer request keep going to the inbox of everybody else. Anybody feel like that? They got the bonus. They got the raise. How she get discovered by a godly man and she was on a stripper pole two months ago. I've been praise dancing for the last six years. Y'all don't want to talk to me. How does she get the blessing? And I've been seeking God. How did they get the raise? How did they get the opportunity? Make it make sense. It doesn't make sense to me, God. Why is it those who live lawless, it appears as though the sky of their life is full with sunshine, but me, I'm praying my life looks like this. I'm fasting, my life looks like this. I'm seeking your face, my life looks like this. I came to encourage you this afternoon. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. There's a blessing somewhere in this problem. Stress does not have to be your disposition. And once the storm finally stops, once the clouds finally roll back, the turbulence finally ceases, and you land on the runway of why God wouldn't let you settle. You land on the runway of peace. You land on the runway of abundance. You will finally unearth and discover, I had to go through that just so I can get to this. <laughs> if I didn't go through that, I never would have got to this. And the only way I have this is because I got through that. Hallelujah. Preach, Holy Spirit. I tried to get us to understand in February of our King Encounter series, I noticed every encounter was due to a problem. The woman who was crooked, that was a problem. Somebody say problem. problem. The man who had a withered hand, y'all talk to me, he was a what? Problem. A man who had a legion of demons, that was what? A problem. But the problem was a prerequisite for the encounter. Can I mess y'all up? Who in the house can God trust with problems? <laughs> I know you want him to give you abundance, but what if God can only give you the abundance if you first have the problem? Who can I trust with problems? Because problems are invitation for the miraculous. No problem, no miracle. There's a blessing somewhere in this problem. Stress does not have to be your disposition. So I want to speak around this thought from this subject for part one of our brand new stress management series, when stress attacks. 
When stress attacks one of the undetected weapons of the enemy, we always think diabolical activity and the enemy is a demon, a stronghold, or something demonic. But what if I told you one of his most slept on weapons is stress? God, would you flood this atmosphere? So many of us, God, have stress in our hearts, stress in our minds. The news doesn't make it better. Talking to our family doesn't make it better. Sometimes looking in the mirror doesn't make it better. All of us will have are currently experiencing some form of stress. And I pray, oh God, that you use my my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. Speak through your vessel. Make me invisible so that you are seen as visible so we could, be, so we could become people who don't just talk about it, but we could actually experience for real this time the peace of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who agrees with that prayer would just shout in the room, amen. 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 Problems will happen. But stress does not have to be your disposition. Can I get us to say this confession? I miss giving y'all confessions. Can I get y'all to say this confession? Everybody online, could you put this in the room in all caps? Can I get us to say, Father, give me the discernment and trust in you so I won't allow stress to rob me of the blessing. Again, Father, give me the discernment and trust in you so I won't allow stress to rob me of the blessing. Of the blessing. Church family, this one, like this series is going to be an investment in your soul care. This series is going to be a catalyst for us to experience healing on the inside. This one is an inside job to help you win within. Just where I've arrived, I'd rather win within. Anybody else? Because to win outside, but to lose inside sets the stage for depression and suicidal thoughts. I don't want to just win on the outside. I want to win on the inside. For many of us, looking at your post, (laughs) your post, your profile, and your presentation, you have deceived all of us into believing you killing it. (laughs) When we look at you, your post, profile, and presentation, you look as though you're killing it at the expense of you're really sacrificing your mental health, your biblical standards, and your spiritual growth on the altar of appearance. This one... This series is divinely tailored to help us win on the inside. I know you could upload and post your vacation and upload your favorite dish and upload your bay, but oh, if it was possible where we could upload our soul. (laughs) Like if we could upload our spirit though, would Instagram have enough filters? (laughs) Would Photoshop have enough editing or blemish removal tools where it would look pretty enough for you to post it? (laughs) When on the inside, and my prayer and my plea has been as we are swiftly approaching the ninth inning of this 2022 calendar year, it's coming fast, isn't it? We're already in August. For you know, we're going to be singing jingle bells, jingle bells. As we are swiftly approaching the ninth inning of this 2022 calendar year, I want us to become people who experience, listen, please hear me, not just say it, not just post it, not just sing about it, but I want us to actually be people who experience the peace of God. Like actually experience it. 
Some of us have never experienced the peace of God. I have never met so many Bible quoting, scripture posting, claimed Christians who, ne who don't have any peace, but your roommate is, roommate is chaos. Never met so many Christians who claim that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I'm like, okay, how are you in Christ? And Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 tells us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but I need a piece of weed to have peace. I need, I need to have an alcohol. This day has been so stressful. I have to have some Hennessy to have peace. I have to have an alcoholic beverage. I know y'all don't like this. I have to have an alcoholic beverage for me to have peace. I got to have an orgasm exchange. Y'all don't want to talk to me for me to first have peace. I got to have that good morning text or that good night text for me to have peace. How is it Jesus is called the Prince of Peace? And I claim to be in Jesus, but I don't have the Prince's Peace. <laughs> And this is just me, y'all. Y'all have to excuse me. I'm one of those believers. I don't like quoting stuff and not experiencing it. Amen. That's just me. If it don't make sense to me, I got questions. I don't just come to church, amen, and don't get what they're talking about. And that has permeated over into the way I preach and pastor to where I try to make us understand it. I want to actually experience what, 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 what does the peace of God feel like, look like? Because to regurgitate and not illuminate produces doubt. This is why people doubt all this stuff. Because we regurgitate, but there is no illumination, meaning reveal. We regurgitate, but there is no illumination, so it causes for people to doubt. I don't want to just preach about the peace of God. I want to experience it. I want to incubate it. I want to be filled with it. I want to be acquainted with it. I want to have the peace of God on the inside of me and on the inside of you to such a degree where you have the peace of God in abundance to an overflow. To where when people get in a close proximity to you, they get splashed by the peace of God too. It's just something about your house. It's just something about the conversation I had. I just believe this, y'all. People carry climates. And just like you can hang around that toxic uncle or that toxic friend, and every time you're around them, you start to get stressed out too. I believe you can carry the kingdom of heaven. You can have fire on the inside of you and in your bosom so that every time I preach, I preach fire. Every time I speak, I speak fire. I don't get credit for it. It's what God is doing on the inside of me. Everybody watching online, could you put the fire emoji in the chat? Everybody in the house say fire. I don't want to just say it. I want to actually, there you go, feel it, experience it. Amen. Now it's time to come for your life. Y'all ready? The whole sermon's about to turn right now. Okay? Now listen, God will give you his perfect peace. He will. But you have to guide your head. See how quiet it got right there? So the whole sermon, we didn't turn. God will give you his perfect peace, but you have to guide your thoughts. Many of us, God has given you his peace, but you don't focus on him. Let me give you a Bible. I'm not up here just preaching my opinion. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Let's put this on the screen where they can see this. Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Look, y'all, whose mind, oh, there it is, whose mind is stayed on you. Is it God has not given you his perfect peace or is it your mind? Your mind is not stayed on him. Your mind is stayed on what CNN is saying. Your mind is stayed on what they're posting. Your mind is stayed on what they're saying, but your mind is not on him. I'll give you my perfect peace, but you have to guide your head. What if I told you that for many of us, 
Stress is not us being under a constant attack. It can be a weapon. I'll touch on that later on in the sermon. But stress is not always us under a constant attack. Stress is us under a constant thought. Constant. Constant. Okay. So here it is. We need to honestly audit our lives and ask ourselves this question. What role am I playing in? What thoughts am I entertaining that's stressing myself out? See, it's getting quiet. I told you I was taking a turn. Am I the reason and am I the cause of why I am so stressed out? Because it's going to be hard for you to discover peaceful lanes when stress is giving you directions. Did y'all hear what I just said? It's going to be hard for you to discover peaceful lanes when stress is giving you directions. Or let me put it this way. Stress is not always what's going on, but rather it's our desire to control what's going on. Like the byproduct of wanting to wanting control is to choose to be stressed out and to choose stress is to choose to suffer twice. Like you already going to suffer with denying your flesh. You already going to suffer with not giving in to the sinful nature. You're telling me you're going to stress yourself out too by trying to in fear and take God's job? That's what you're doing. You're stressed out because you want to control the outcome. You want to control how fast they change. You want to control the growth of your ministry. You want to control the growth of your platform. You honestly think that your grind dictates how this is going to grow versus the outcome belongs to God. Could you be so stressed? out because you're trying to put on God's clothes? The byproduct of having control issues is to choose to be stressed out. The future is not causing stress. It's your desire and obsession with controlling your future that's stressing you out. I'm stressed because anytime we're in between blessings and lessons, Satan will always send stressing. <laughs> this is so good, y'all. Anytime you're in between a blessing and a lesson, the enemy will try to use stressing so that you'll doubt God for the blessing and you'll miss the blessing because of the stressing. I can't even enjoy it because I'm stressing myself out. Now, I was beginning to search the text and I said, who could really be like a biblical candidate that we could use that's not a common biblical candidate that we could preach from that could show us what stress does, because stress declares war on what you believe. Hear me. You really don't know what you believe until you're stressed. This is why all of that profit lying and you're going to get a house, that worked until we experienced the stress of a pandemic. Now... The word of faith preachers who think that God only wants you wealthy and healthy and have all of this abundance and blessing and you're never going to suffer. I'm like, I guess the apostles didn't get the memo. <laughs> like the apostles, they missed that part because they suffered greatly. And so we have Christians that know how to be blessed, but don't know how to suffer. And one of the fruits of the spirit is long suffering. And so, when we get stressed, we doubt the God who blesses. Because stress is a declaration of war on what you believe. What biblical candidate could serve us? And God revealed to me, check out my boy, John the Baptist. I want to show y'all this, okay? John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. 
All right. And I want to take you all the way back. Like usually this part is only read right around Christmas time. But I want to show you the part where after the angel spoke to Mary, Mary went to her cousin Elizabeth. And I want you to just see this narrative. OK, Luke chapter one. Verse 39, there's several passages of scriptures I have to show you, so bear with me. Luke chapter 1, verse 39, it says, At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit in a loud voice. She exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So John the Baptist was leaping for joy over the presence of the Lord in the womb. All right. Now, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, a little later on in John's life. Verse 11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into his barn, into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, hold up, bro. <laughs> uh, I need to be baptized by you. And down you come to me. And Jesus is like, it's okay, cuz. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now I want you to look at John chapter 3, verse 25. It says, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man you were talking about, that, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, bro, he's baptizing every, and everyone's going to him. To this, John replied, a person can only receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom, the friend who attends the bridegroom, waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. Look at this, y'all. He must become greater and I must become less. Now, Luke chapter 7, verse 17, our last foundational text. This news about Jesus spread through Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples told him about all these things, calling two of them. He sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Yeah. What? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Hold on, wait a minute. Jerry got a problem with it. How do you go from leaping in the womb for joy at the presence of God in the room, Luke 1, verse 44, to baptizing and saying, I'm not even worthy to carry this dude's sandals, and you want me to baptize you, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, to listen, everybody's going to him, that's great. And that makes me excited because he must become greater and I must become less. John 3, verses 29 and 30 to Luke chapter 7. Go ask him, is he really the one that we're expecting or somebody else to come? What is happening? I want to give you a little exegesis so you could understand the backdrop of this so you can have some scriptural intelligence. John has been in prison now. For about a year. 
He constantly will call out Herod for his sin. He was in the wilderness with honey and locusts and baptizing. And now John is in prison and he hears rumors that he might get executed. He have his head chopped off and he's hearing all of this. And then on top of that, he's hearing that the religious leaders are rejecting Jesus. The chief priests are rejecting Jesus. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and all the other C's, all the teachers of the law don't want to have nothing to do with Jesus. And now John is in this prison cell hearing this and thinking this is not the way I thought it was going to go. He is stressed due to the situation and stress caused him to ask the question, are you really the Messiah? Like I've been out here baptizing every day, bro. I've been telling people, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Every day, have I been wasting my time with all this prayer? Have I been wasting my time with all of this coming to church and all of this serving? Because you cannot experience stress and not battle with abandonment. Talk Holy Spirit. Please hear me. You cannot deal with stress and not also battle with abandonment. God, where are you? Where are you? I thought you were supposed to be Jaira. How did I get laid off in the pandemic? Where's that provision at, God? Stress causes you to battle with abandonment. You can't feel stress and not have abandonment. God, I thought you were supposed to be a protector. Some protector you are. Where were you at during Uvalde? Where were you at during Sandy Hook? Where were you at? See, these are the hard questions that people don't like to preach because it does not give big offerings, but it's the questions that you have in the pew and it's the questions that I have. God, where were you at? Where were you at when warlord tyrants are raping women and men in Ukraine and other parts of the world? Where are you? And so what atheists and agnostics will do is they will try to use evil to disprove God. Can I give you a little apologetics? We try to use evil to disprove God. Most atheists say, I don't believe in your God because if a good God was really up there, why doesn't he take care of all this evil? If your God was really good, remove evil. Not recognizing what you're really saying is if God was so good, he should kill me. (laughs) Somebody caught it. Somebody caught it. If God was so good, he should remove evil. That means he should kill all mankind. We tried that already with Noah's days. (laughs) So really, evil does not disprove God. I would argue it actually proves God. How can you say that, Pastor? It's because how do you measure what's evil without some measurement of what's good? You can't say a a crooked line is crooked unless you have first seen a straight one. So when I say my God is good, you can't measure what is evil if there is no such thing as good. Let's break it down a little further. There is no such thing as a shadow without a light. Now you can have light without shadows. That's what's going to be heaven one day. Well, there's no sin anymore. There's no pain anymore. There's no weeping and gnashing of teeth anymore with our God because his glory fills the temple and there's no need for the moon and there's no need for the stars because we will be in his presence. You can't have shadows without light, but you can't have light without shadows. The shadows reveal the evil. So what if I were to tell you evil is our free will in perversion? This is so good, y'all. God loves you, and he loves me so much where he gave us free will. He doesn't want robots. If he would not have given us free will, it would not have been love. So watch this. God is responsible for the fact of your freedom, but man is responsible of the acts of our freedom. Does that make sense? Somebody say, say it again. God is responsible for the facts of our freedom. We have free will that is a fact, but man is responsible of the acts of our freedom. Who does evil, God or us? 
God or us? It's us. And watch this. Every good deed we do has rippling effects. Me surrendering to Jesus back in 2006 had a rippling effect to 2022 where you're hearing this word on today. And when I'm dead and gone, there will be people who can still listen to sermons because one act of obedience has rippling effects. Now watch this. One act of rebellion also has rippling effects. You murder them, then they got to murder you. Now we got to ride on you because you murdered them. And now that has rippling effects. Let me go a little deeper. It's likened unto a thunderstorm right now in Africa. A hot air mass and a cold air mass collided, and that has rippling effects. And that thunderstorm on Africa right now gets over the Atlantic water and becomes a low-pressure system that has rippling effects. And that low-pressure system becomes a tropical cyclone genesis, which we know as a tropical storm, which becomes a hurricane, which devastates New Orleans. All the way from a hot air mass in Africa, all the way to devastating in New Orleans, it has rippling effects. So if you really want to say, why doesn't God stop all evil? The real question is, what type of God loves us so much where he will allow us to have rippling effects of evil and not kill us as soon as we do it? You can't. You can't be stressed and not battle with abandonment. And when you have healthy apologetics, you'll be able to defend your faith when stress tells you doubt. The reason you doubt him is because we've been saying so much Bible stuff, but we really don't believe it. And it just takes the right trial. I'm talking prophetically. It takes the right trial. It takes the right heartbreak. It takes the right disappointment to expose. Do I really believe all this stuff? You can't battle with stress and not battle with abandonment. Listen to what Jesus says. The main attribute of Satan is. John chapter 10, verse 10. Is this good? This is all groundwork for the series. Jesus says, the thief. I can stop right there. (laughs) Ben, I can stop right there. Look, the main attribute he gave Satan was thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, or certain translations say, more abundantly. Okay, now watch this. The thief comes to steal. What does stress do? Steals. 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 He's behind adultery. He's behind it. Why? Because it steals trust. It's hard to build a covenant with somebody you don't trust. Okay? He's behind counterfeits. Why? Because it steals peace. He constantly will provide us with a series of events that steals joy. So the blessings that God gives me, I can't fully enjoy them. And now we have people who will try to use that evil to disprove God. I wish one day they would let me be on like some bench and let me have a conversation on behalf of God. And I would say, listen, you can't have intervention without invitation. Where is God when all this evil? We marched him straight out of our schools. You want him to interfere when we don't give him invitation? He knocks. We have to let him in. Satan comes in wherever there's an open door. God comes in when you say, come in this house. Come in this place. Rule our school system. Rule our nation. We want to take him out of everything in our Pledge of Allegiance and then wonder, where is God? Intervention comes through invitation. You wonder why your marriage is on life support? You told God to get out. Invite him and watch what he does with it. Stress is designed to cultivate weariness. Because weariness produces the loss of hope. Bible all day, Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. 
but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Stress is to defer hope. This is why, as I was studying, I recognized, oh, this is high on the objective of the syllabus of hell is to get us to be stressed people. John is preparing the way. He's made arrangements. How does he get to the place where he's like, have I wasted my life? Is there somebody else that is really the Messiah? Did I miss it? Stress. Stress. There are five types of stress that I want us to take heed to. And the reason I constantly keep on saying the enemy will try to use stress when you're blessed it's so that you can miss the blessing. Like you could pray and ask God to send rain. Hell would try to stress you with the mud. <laughs> you pray for it. Pray and ask God to give you an opportunity. You get a call for that opportunity. Hell would try to stress you with your insecurities. You see? God give growth to the platform. He gives growth and then the enemy will try to stress you with comments. I'm like, stop letting people who are on the bench dictate your performance. All right, let me keep going. Five types of stress. The first type of stress is induced stress. This means you're stressed out because of you. <laughs> Somebody said period. <laughs> you're stressed out because of you. It's the overthinking and overanalyzation that is the abuse of your innovative self. Woo! Overthinking and overanalyzing is abusing your own innovative self. Look how innovative you are. You have thought of a horrible outcome and are physically preparing for it. <laughs> you saying you stress and it haven't even happened yet. You laughing, but I know I'm talking to somebody. I've done it. You are stressed out over your thoughts. And do stress. See, listen, church, we produce three things. We can produce storms, seasons, and runways. That's what Destiny Decisions was all about. You can make choices that produce conditions. And so now I'm dealing with a storm because of my choices. You could also produce seasons. This is a good thing too. If in the season of your off season you grind them, then in the next season you could glean from the fruit, fruit of your hustle and God blessing your ministry. You could also produce runways. That's what my parents did back in April of 1996 when they started the ministry. Years later, it'll be a runway for me. Right? Listen, the Bible says a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So you right now can make a choice that has a runway for somebody behind you. Your children should not have to deal with the same uncircumcised Philistine that you're facing today because you beat it. That's why I told us purpose fixes problems. When you die, some problems should no longer exist in the earth because you killed it. Induced stress. What role am I playing in stressing myself out? What am I worried about? All worry is is a down payment on a problem you may never have. And I'm stressed and I can't enjoy it. And we say churchy stuff like, ooh, girl, the devil is busy. Um, he's really not that busy. You know why? Because you're doing his work. <laughs> He's supposed to stress you out. You stressing yourself out. The devil busy. No, you are. Wonder why you can't sleep at night. Right here. Somebody say induced. induced. The second type of stress is inherited stress. Some of us were cultivated and our childhood was stressful. Your childhood was stressful. You don't even recognize your childhood made you a survivor. For what I was exposed to and what I went through, I survived childhood. <laughs> Serious. And so now this is, these are people who produce stress because they inherited stress. Where they stress about stuff that's not even there. You ever, ever had a conversation with people like that? They find stuff to stress about. It's because they were cultivated in stressful things. And so now the stress that I have is inherited. The storms around me became the storm in me. And when we don't break cycles, cycles become embedded in our language and personality. 
Stress about everything. Peace causes suspicion. Something ain't right. <laughs> Some, see, I don't know. What's the catch? <laughs> Inherited stress. I was raised in paranoia and inconsistency. And it causes for me as an adult to walk around stressful. The second form of stress is allowed stress. Allowed stress is the secondhand smoke of trauma that we allow ourselves to breathe in. Allowed stress. You don't have to keep dating her, bruh. You don't. Why are you stressing yourself out? This is allowed stress. Ooh, you don't have to go to Thanksgiving dinner in November. It stresses you out. But we family. But it's stressful. I leave there burdened. Mama, Labor Day weekend, I'm coming in town to stay with you for the weekend. No, you're not. (laughs) That's me. No, I did a whole message with my wife about it. That's boundaries. That's boundaries. Are you stressed because of the stress you're allowing yourself to be stressed by? You see him calling? You get hit. Ignore. Your head's not even there yet. You still stressed about this traffic you're going through. And now they call it. You know they're going to be complaining. Don't answer it. I tell my wife all the time, you don't have to answer it. Well, I just, give me the phone. Give me the phone. <laughs> you need somebody in your life like that. Give me the phone. Give me the, give me the phone. Get off of social media. Loud stress. Number four, surrounding stress. This is the stress you can't do nothing about. Monkey pox. What is that? My wife and I were talking about this morning. It's like, if there's another virus Biden on there, I'm declaring a state of emergency. I'm like, why? I don't know. Please. And I'm like, Lord, we're not shutting the doors. We're not. We're not shutting the doors this time. It's stressful things all around you that you can't control. Surrounding stress. Five, satanic stress. That's what I've been talking about in this message. Who can you use that shows us that Satan can use stress, Job. Satanic stress. I don't got time to tell the story, sis. <laughs> I'll be up here. I know I'm back, but I ain't trying to hear. We got weeks of this series. <laughs> Satanic stress. The enemy can create events around you to try to stress you out. Five levels of stress, induced stress, inherited stress, allowed stress, surrounding stress, satanic stress. So I want to show you something. Come here, Torrance. I want to show you something. I have two points and I'm done. In my life, many times, I've asked myself, why do I feel like this? Can I be vulnerable? Have you ever, like, felt on one, but you don't know why? This ain't just a feminine thing. Because I used to think that was just women. Just, why are you crying? I don't know. <laughs> Me and I was a little different. We just kind of mad. What's wrong, bro? I'm good. <laughs> I don't know why I'm mad. And so, what I recognized, God gave us the gift of life, right? So this is your life, and it's a gift. Somebody say gift. Yeah. And so what God wants to do is he wants to bless you. Let's say this is a blessing of sleeping at night. A prosperity preacher would not bless you with a million dollars. No, bless you with sleep. What's a million if you can't sleep? Right? I want to bless you with sweet sleep. But remember, God will give you his peace. You have to guard your head. Stress interrupts the foundation. So when God gives you the blessing, somebody say blessing of sweet sleep. Every blessing, the blessing of, I want to just give you clarity. Every blessing that God is trying to give you. See, y'all didn't know there was a hole in this box, did you? This is how we look at people and we're like, how are they tripping? Look at all the blessings God giving them. Like, what's she tripping about? God constantly blessing her? God's blessing him? What, 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 what is he tripping about? It's because stress won't let you maintain it. Now us in the audience looking, Torrance is blessed. Somebody said, that's a nice box. 
got a nice house, nice career. But you don't know over here, because I am letting stress rob me of my spiritual roots, I can't maintain any blessing God has given me. And I'm trying to get us to see it's not that God is not giving you his peace. It's that the thief is stealing it. And you can't maintain it. That's supposed to be yours. And what I want this series to do, put this on the bottom. I want this series to be able to be a series. When God blesses you, maintain it. When God gives you a blessing, I'm not feeling, well, what do they think? No, I'm enjoying this blessing this time. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to thank God, and I'm going to rejoice that he's blessing me. And I don't care what you think. I don't care what mama thinks. I don't care what the rest of them think, because I know what it was like to not have the blessing, have the blessing and be stressed out. Somebody say, this time I'm going to enjoy it. Whatever God gives me, every open door, every opportunity, every opportunity of grace, every opportunity of mercy, every peace that he gives me, I'm going to enjoy it. No longer will I not be able to maintain what God is trying to give me because I'm stressed. We have people doubting God because stress is interrupting your foundation. Two points and I'm done. I'm good, T. Thank you. So how do we start this series? How do we begin to manage our stress? Point number one, how do we do with this virus? Is the prescription of prayer. Okay? We're not going to like this. I'm going to go fast. It's the prescription of prayer. The reason you cannot regulate your head is because there is minimal or no prayer life at all. You cannot worship and worry at the same time because worship takes your problems to the problem solver. If you are not praying and you're not worshiping, you are stressing your own self out. There's a level of mental strength and mental fortitude you can only get from prayer. The most slept on weapon you have as a Christian is prayer. Listen, those who have a prayer life, I challenge you. Those who have a prayer life, prayer life you know you have to constantly cast down thoughts. So... All the time I'm praying, especially if you just start in your prayer life, you have to cast down, I'm hungry, and cast down, what time the game, come on, and ca go home and pray tonight for 30 minutes. Set your alarm for 30 minutes, and you see how many thoughts you have to keep on casting down. Now, the person who has a prayer life, who prays every morning and every night, I'm not talking about driving in traffic. I'm not talking about some little, God, thank you for this food. God is great. I'm talking about 30 minutes of dedicated time. Just you and God. Watch how many thoughts you have to cast down. And I don't want to take an assumption as though everybody knows how to pray. Five steps, I give them all the time. Praise, worship, repent, petitions, Request. You don't know how to pray? Start with that tonight. Praise. What is that? Thank God for what he's done. Worship. What is that? Thank God for who he is. Repentance. What is that? Asking God to chop down the tree of my rebellion and pluck up the roots. I'm not asking for modification. I'm asking for a heart change. Okay? Pray for others. Pray for your mama and them. Pray for me. Watch the news tonight. You get a long prayer list. Watch ABC 13 at 10 o'clock. You have a long prayer list of who to pray for. And then lastly, pray for yourself. Just do it for 30 minutes tonight. And watch how many thoughts you have to cast down. Prayer is so powerful that the apostles came to Jesus and said, man, this, this spirit wouldn't come out. And Jesus said, oh, this one takes a combination. You're not going to get this one out with your left jab. You're not going to get this one out with your right jab. This one needs a left and a right. Prayer and fasting. You need a combination to be free from this. Prayer. Somebody say prayer. prayer. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, not Facebook, not Instagram, not weed, not alcohol. Come to me, 
all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Prayer. A decided mind is the byproduct of having a prayer life. Your thoughts are affected by your prayerlessness or your prayer life. Because the way you think dictates the way you think. Okay. Number two, the prescription of thankfulness. Think jacked up, thank and lift them up. Thankfulness. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Y'all not talking to me. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord when you get a raise. Rejoice in the Lord when it hurts. Rejoice in the Lord always. And then Paul says, okay, again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication. Look at this. With thanksgiving. I don't even have time to unpack it. Prayer. Prayer. Stressed out here? How's your prayer life? This is part one. We're going to have weeks of this. How, how's, how's your prayer life? Because it affects this. It affects this. It says prayer and supplication. You know what that means? Pet petition, and it comes from the word supply. So when you make prayers of supplication, you're praying to the one who could only supply you in this area. Make my petitions, my request, praying for others. And I just feel led as we're going into the holiday season. What if God wanted to speak to you for the next few weeks how to manage your stress? Because it's making you doubt me. It's making you skip prayer time. And it's making you question my involvement in your world. And just like Torrance is holding that box, God is trying to pour a whole lot of blessings on us. But stress has it to where we can't maintain it. So God, forgive us for wanting to control the outcome. We come against the enemy who is constantly trying to steal. Give us the wisdom, the discipline, and most importantly, the intimacy with you, God. So that we're not letting surrounding stress or induced stress or any other form of stress plague us and rob us of what we believe. I thank you that you do it, God, and you work on our hearts as we do our part and discipline our mind. Prayer starts as discipline and then it comes desire. Help us to desire you so that we could shift from a have-to heart to a want to heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.